Hi everyone, it's MJ, the fellow actuary, and I got a message on LinkedIn from a school student who was interested in the actuarial profession, and he asked if he could send a bunch of questions. And I was like, like, sure, why not? And he has sent 23 questions, so what we're gonna be doing in this video is answering the 23 questions that he sent through. And you can maybe forward this video to somebody else that you know who's also maybe still at school and is interested in pursuing the actuarial career path. Although, just a quick disclaimer, I'm not your traditional actuary. I have taken a slightly different view, um, or different journey. So I'm not definitely gonna give like model answers that represent the whole of the actual profession, but I'll give them my personal answers. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully there are enough for, for his, his project. I think it's a school project, yeah. He has to interview a professional from a career that he would like to pursue and he says he's been watching my YouTube channel and he's got some, some questions for me. And he's from Benoni, which is quite cool, very close to my hometown of, of Bedford View. So first off, uh, the question is, what is your, your job title? And this is something that he spoke about in, in the, the preamble, saying you know he's looking forward to becoming an actuarial scientist. And we don't technically use scientist in our in our job title, even though we're studying actuarial science, we just consider ourselves as, as actuaries. And then when you get to my stage, uh, you can consider yourself as a fellow actuary because this is something that, uh, it's always a fun game to play when you go to parties. Um, you'll meet someone, they'll be like, yeah, I'm an actuary. And you're like, oh cool, what did you do your, your fellowship in? And then they tend to get a little bit shy or embarrassed. And they're like, oh no, well, I, I haven't written that exam yet. And essentially, there's different levels of, of actuary. Um, you've got your student actuary, and this is somebody who's just joined the actuarial society as a student member, and they're writing their exams. Then when you finish the first half of the exams, you can become something known as an associate actuary. And once you've done that, you can then choose which exams you want to specialize in. And once you've specialized in a few subjects, you choose one of those to do your fellowship in. And once you complete that and a whole bunch of other requirements, you can then say that you are a fellow of an actuarial society. Um, there's even one up on the fellow, and that is something known as a statutory actuary. And that is someone who has the regulatory uh, powers to sign off on reserves on insurance companies and stuff like that. So. There's quite a bit of a hierarchy, but yeah, we refer to ourselves as, as actuaries rather than actuarial scientists. So that is question one. Question two, can you take me through your career path and how you have worked your way to where you are now? So my career, I mean, it's been fairly short. I mean, I kind of finished university at the end of 2013. Um, 2014, I spent as basically just being my own consultant, doing little bits of jobs here and there. 20, at the end of 2014 to the beginning of 2016, I did kind of work at a company. It wasn't very formal. Like, I mean, the like it wasn't like a contract until like quite later on. Um, so it was a little bit informal, but the work that I was doing was around building administrative systems around insurance companies. So very much on the tech side, and we were known as actuarial engineers. That was kind of the, the title that they gave us. Um, I didn't like working in an office. I didn't like the fact that, you know, this is the time that you work. Um, I'm very much someone who sometimes I like working in the morning, sometimes I like working in the evening, sometimes I want to take a nap in the afternoon. So beginning of 2016, I returned to doing uh, consultancy work where I basically get to get to work for myself and have various clients. And yeah, I've been doing that now, what, coming up towards the end of, of 2020. So that has been the, the career path in a nutshell. And yeah, the nice thing about being a consultant for yourself is that you get to work on a whole bunch of different pr uh, projects and everything's always new. It's not kind of like going into the office, doing the same thing, seeing the same people. Uh, there's a little bit more, more excitement out there. Um, question three, what year did you qualify? and how old were you? So I'm always, I always kind of forget my, my age, which is a very weird thing to, to do. Um, so I'll give you the dates and then you can kind of work out everything. So I was born in December, 1991, um, graduated from WITS with my honors in 2013, uh, wrote the final actuarial exam in May, 2017, but only got the fellowship designation a year later in 2018 because 
like I said, after you do the exams, it's not the end of the story. You still have to do like professionalism courses and you have to um, build up some work-based skills and all these other kind of things. So yeah, those were the key, key dates. Born in 91, uh, got the fellowship in 2018. Um, you can do, do the maths on how, how old I was there. I don't know, for some reason, I think because in actuarial science, we, when we talk about age, we sometimes refer to age, um, last birthday, age nearest birthday, age next birthday, and it just, it just confuses me. So whenever somebody's like, how old are you? I'm just like, I was born in 1991. Um, I know I'm under 30, but, uh, but that, is, that gap is slowly, slowly closing down. Um, what your, oh, how many years did it take, you, take for you to be fully qualified? So yeah, from 2013, I finished, and then 2018, um, I got the fellowship. So yeah, that was, it was a few, some people take a little bit longer, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I was, being a, a consultant, I was able to give myself a little bit more study time just so I could focus on getting these these exams done. So it was a little bit sooner than, than most other people, but like I said, it was one of the other, the privileges of being able to work for yourself is that you could have more, more study time. At companies, you do get study leave, um, but the work still has to be done and can become a very stressful situation. So some people do take a little bit longer to, to write all the exams. Um, was it difficult finding your first job? So I kind of had, I mean, yeah, I, I had quite a few jobs lined up as soon as I left university. I mean, especially if you if you go to Witz, that's the university in Johannesburg, um, the lecturers basically take your CV and they find you jobs for you. I mean, I remember when we were in our honors class, we would have companies would come and like try seduce us to come work for them. I remember one company was Platinum Life. They gave us like perfumes and beauty products. Um, then we would have even like non-actuarial companies like the tele uh, communication companies like Vodacom. They came and they presented and they said, oh, this is why it's so exciting. So finding your first job was, was quite easy if you get into the honors program. If you don't get into the honors program, it, it gets a little bit uh, difficult. So that's why when you're in the undergrad, it's so, so important that you work hard, you get those exemptions so that you qualify for the honors program because then getting your first job is, is a bit of a breeze. Um, I went as a sole consultant because I already had people who knew I was studying actuarial science. They said, hey, um, can you do some work for me here? I had one of the, the ex well, guest lectures that was running a hedge fund and wanted me to help out on some banking analysis thing. So. Finding your first job, if you get into honors, very easy, very easy. If you don't get into honors, it's it can be a little bit um, tricky. I've heard some people have struggled to find their find their first job, but no, job wise, it's it has been quite quite straightforward. Um, the next question is: I plan to study a BSc actuarial science degree at Wits. What is your opinion on this choice of course and university? In the industry so that's exactly what I did so this is gonna be like a very heavily biased answer but in my view this university is the best university in the world for actuarial science now the reason why I say that is because when you factor in everything into consideration um, it's it's affordable and you're getting a very very good uh, education I mean yes you can go to Harvard you can go to Stanford you can go to these you know other universities outside there in the world and you're gonna pay an arm and a leg for a qualification like that. And you're gonna be getting, if not a slightly better education at, at WITS. I remember when we were at WITS, one of our stats lectures, now I could be wrong on this, but if I remember correctly, our stats lecture was, was this genius guy. And his students were heading up the stats department at Stanford University. So you can imagine, where would you wanna be, who do you wanna be taught by, the, by the students or the master himself? Unfortunately, I do think he's retired now. I think my year was like his, his final year, but very, very smart guy. And then from yeah, on the actuarial side as well, we had some of the best lecturers, I think, in the world. Like they were really, really good. They knew their stuff. I mean, the one lecturer that I had is now going to become president of the Inter International Actuarial Association. Um, so it's like we really, really had some amazing lecturers at WITS. There, there still are some amazing lecturers at WITS. And then a quick comparison between, because people always say, oh, BITS or, or UCT. Um, when you get into the honors um, thing, like the honors of, of VITS, in my opinion, it's better than uh, UCT and Stellenbosch in the sense that at VITS, you can choose whichever subject that you want to specialize in and it will be given to you at VITS. 
If you go to UCT or Stellenbosch, I think Stellenbosch specializes in two subjects, UCT specializes in the other two subjects. So if you want to do one that's in Stellenbosch, you have to drive quite a long time. Although, like I say, that was back in my day and that's like seven years ago. So things have changed now with COVID, the, the lectures might be online, so you might not have to do all that driving, but VITS does give you more exemptions, gives you more choices and actually streamlines your process to becoming an actuary quicker as well as finding you a job. So it is, like I say, probably the best university in, in South Africa, if not the world, but like I say, I went there. So take that with a bit of, a bit of bias. Um, also, Joburg is a great place to study because there's nothing else to do in Joburg, whereas I'm living here in Cape Town, um, there's the beach, there's the mountain, there's the winelands, the, the, I mean the Cape Town city is a lot more beautiful and you can actually go there and like Joburg, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, so there's less distractions in Joburg, which is great because it means you'll focus on, on your studying. So yeah, so that's question six, 100%, uh, yeah, great choice. Question seven, what further studies would you advise for once I have qualified as an actuary? So definitely want to expose yourself to more programming. So when we were at VITS, yes, we did have a little bit of a programming um, element to it. And it is something that's now being embedded in the actual exams. But I would highly recommend taking your programming studying to, to the next level. It'll just make you a lot more useful and efficient as, as an actuary. Um, Question eight, what made you choose this career? Um, look, I was I was a little bit arrogant after school. I had done very well. I was the top student at my school. I'd come top 50 in the country. Um, I thought I was the smartest person in the world. So when they said actuarial science is the hardest, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take that challenge on. And yeah, it, it humbled me very quickly because it was incredibly difficult. Um, first year was, was a big struggle for me, but yeah, I basically chose the career because they said it was the hardest. I didn't actually know what it was about. I, <laughs> I went, you don't want to make big career decisions without knowing what it's going to entail. But I'm really glad I did. Actuarial science, it kind of changes the way you think about the world. Um, it allows you to understand uncertainty and probability a lot better than I think any other degree out there. So I'm glad I did it. But why I did it? It was because of his reputation of, of being difficult. And I thought, you know what, let me let me have a bit of a challenge in life. Um, question nine, what are your main roles and responsibilities? What does a typical day involve? Like I said, this is where I'm very different to your traditional actuaries. Because I'm working by myself, it, it fluctuates. It really does um, change. So these past months, I've been working with the Actuarial Society on helping students get ready for the online exams. I've been on the online committee uh, to try and say, you know, how should these online exams be designed and how should they, you know, how should students go through the whole process. And so the, the, the responsibilities that I've been having has been prepping students to get ready for, for these exams. But like I say, that was just because it was actual exam season now. There was a two month project that I did. Um, now what I'm looking at is I'm playing around with blockchain and just making like fun games on the blockchain because I think decentralized finance is like the biggest buzzword and the biggest con out there. But blockchain is still quite cool when it comes to, to games. So it's like I say, I'm on a little bit of a, of a break now because I've just had two intense months and before that there were other projects that were also really really intense it's been a crazy year 2020 has been a crazy year so currently i'm on holiday i've got no clients um and like i said i'm playing around with a few projects here or there um so yeah at the moment i have no no role and responsibility but that might change next week or or next month depending on when i get decide to yeah wake up from my break and get back back into the swing of things um what do you like most and least about your job? I'll start with the least. What I, what I like the least about the job is, is that it can get difficult, especially like, oh, I was, like I said, we were, we were teaching, um, what, I, gosh, they keep changing the subject names, but it was financial engineering, um, sometimes known as financial economics. There are some sections in that course that are really difficult and oh, I really, really have to think. And then I've been doing these Zoom lessons and then students will ask these like really good questions. And and sometimes you, if you're not on your A game, it, you can look like a real idiot uh, trying to answer some of them. So probably what I like least about the job is that it, it can get difficult. 
Um, but what I like most is I like the way it's it's changed the way I think. Um, so I really enjoy reading up on philosophy and history and economics and all these kind of things. And having that actuarial background just gives you a slightly different perspective on reality, which makes you read things and say, hmm, they actually weren't considering this, this and that. And it actually allows you to engage with these other subjects and maybe even contribute to it. So I've written an article on on ethics. I spoke about how our morality changes when we become aware of uncertainty. And it's something that I published in the Philosophy Now magazine. And it's something that's really, really cool because like I said, you can read up on other subjects and you can see that because they're assuming a deterministic worldview, they're not seeing the whole picture. And if they allow for uncertainty, some things change. And as an actuary, you can kind of, yeah, you can have a little bit of a go at, at adding to those other things. Um, what would you consider the boring part of your profession? Um, I mean, there's a bit of admin that you've got to do just to kind of keep, keep things up to date, like you... Yeah, but I'd say admin, but I think that's that's something to, to all professions. Uh, what are the most stressful aspects of your job? Um, sometimes, and this is this is something as being a consultant, is you can have a lot of work at the same time. So one client will be like, I want you to do this. And then another client is like, hey, I want you to do that. And you think to yourself, oh, you know, they're small projects. I can do the, the two at the same time. And and that can get stressful. So if, if you don't have good time management as a consultant, um, the work can get stressful and you can end up working quite a lot per day. But if you manage to yeah, just schedule things properly, it shouldn't be too much of a, of a stressful job. Um, do you feel that your salary is comparable or better than those of your peers in other lines of work? So one thing about actuaries is our salaries are quite high and it's, it is, I guess, one of the big perks of the jobs is that the amount of money that you make is considerable. Um, it's a lot better. I mean, I've got a brother who is a chartered accountant. He's working at one of the big four audit firms. He's working on some really big clients. He's got a lot more responsibility. He puts in a lot more effort, a lot more hours than me. And there are some months where I can earn double what he makes. And I think that's because as a consultant, you will earn more than if you're an employee, um, just in the sense that you don't have that security of making that money every single month. And also because remember, when you work at another company, they're making profit off of you. So if you work for yourself, you get to enjoy a little bit more of that profit. So as a consultant, you do get to have a very, very nice salary compared to, to the other professions. But salary in the actuarial world, it it's a very interesting one. Um, our salaries are quite high, but they're not like, like I said, if, if, you, if you're in it for the money, the best thing to do is become an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur's salary, a successful entrepreneur's salary will far outstrip um, an actuary salary. Um, if you're an asset manager and a successful asset manager, your salary f will far outstrip an actuary. But from the professions like actuary, accountant, lawyer, doctor, and all of these kind of ones, actuary is, is probably at, at the top of, of the professions. But like I say, there are other jobs that can make more than an actuary, um, especially ones where you share in the risk and you share in the profit, then your salaries can go yeah, through through the roof. Um, in your opinion, what personality would be well suited to, to this career? Um, so you definitely want to be conscientious. That is like a must. So conscientious means you're prepared to study, you're prepared to be dedicated, you're prepared to follow rules. And, you know, if there's an exam coming up, you can say no to, to all the parties and everything like that. So uh, conscientiousness is probably the top one. Then you want to be quite open. You want to be open to new ideas because sometimes when you come across ideas, you might say, mm, this doesn't feel right. Or, and, and some people, they go away from actuarial science because we're not naturally designed to think in a very empirical, probabilistic uh, way. And if you're not open or flexible in your thinking, um, it's gonna be a little bit of a shut door to you. So conscientious and open are important. Extrovert is probably also a good thing to have. I know the stereotype is that actuaries are introverted, but you wanna be able to communicate well and be able to share your ideas with other people in a business. Also, if you're a consultant and you wanna try to find clients, um, it's difficult to find clients if you're very shy and withdrawn. Uh, so yeah, you kinda of wanna have, have that element as, as well. Um, 
And then agreeableness, you want to kind of be midway with that. And then I think the last of the big five personality traits is like neuroticism. And I guess that's irrelevant to 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 the to work if you have it, if you don't. I guess you are no, if, if you're neurotic, then you get a little bit more stressed easily. But I don't know. I don't know too much about about personalities. But yeah, of those big five traits, conscientiousness is definitely the key one to to have. So Google conscientiousness personality trait. If you have that, you'll be a great actuary. Um, internationally, is South Africa a very good place for actuaries to work, or would it be more beneficial for me to go and work overseas? So actuarial science in South Africa is is at the top of its game. I mean, South Africa. We don't realize this, especially the people who live here, we don't realize how advanced and developed our financial services are. I mean, we've got one of the best um, auditing systems in the world. We've got one of the best financial management systems in the world. We were one of the first to develop regulations for hedge funds. So we really are at the top of the uh, of the game in, in finance. And for that reason, um, a lot of p companies say, oh, South African, come work for our bank in Hong Kong or our bank in London or, you know, some of the various other financial hubs. Um, so actuaries in South Africa are very well sought after internationally because we are brought up in an environment that has a world class financial standards. And because of that, a lot of the companies here hire lots of actuaries. So South Africa is a very good place uh, to work for an actuary, although South Africa is a very dangerous place. I mean, anyone who lives here knows that crime is on the rise. There is extreme inequality um, and it is dangerous. So having a family in South Africa, that's that's a conversation for, for another time. Uh, question 17, do you feel that AI is a rising problem regarding your work? I would say that it is It's not a problem. If anything, it's, it's the opposite. It's a big opportunity. AI is going to help actuaries to work a lot more efficiently. It's going to allow us to get a lot more done. And that's why it's very important that you couple actuarial science with programming so that you're one of the people who are able to use the artificial intelligence tools to be more productive in your work. And you don't want to be someone who's scared of computers or scared at looking at code because it is going to become, it's, it's almost like someone who doesn't want to work on a calculator. That's what I see AI is. AI is just the next, it's the upgraded calculator. So you still need to put in the input and it's the AI is going to do all the heavy maths, heavy calculations, but you're still going to have to need to interpret the, the output and apply that actuarial judgment. But no, AI is a huge, huge opportunity. We sometimes joke that AI is going to take over all of our jobs and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think this is why it's maybe important to get into the fellowship of the actuarial society, because I think the technical actuaries or people who just stay at the associate level or who just, like I say, have the technical background, they're more at risk of being replaced by the AI. Whereas if you go all the way to the fellowship level, you should be fine. Like I say, if anything, it'll make you work a lot more efficiently because I can imagine if, if I had AI, um, I could take on a lot more clients and do a lot more work. So I'm really, really hoping that, that this thing continues to develop further. Um, is the work very demanding and does it require you to work after hours or in other words, does your job allow for a good amount of personal and family time? This this is, depends on where you work for. If you're going and working for a consultancy firm, so I do consultancy on my own and there I'm in control of my own time balance, so that is beautiful. But if you go and work for one of the big consultancy firms like EY, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, um, get prepared to work overtime. If you're working in an investment bank, get prepared to work overtime. Because you can imagine, they entice you with a nice salary, but then in order for them to make money off of you, they need to send you out and bill you and get you doing as much work as possible. So if you cannot put in boundaries, if you cannot tell your employer, listen here, I stop working at six o'clock. Um, they're gonna take advantage of you. You're gonna work long hours. You're gonna be working on Saturdays and Sundays unless you can have good boundaries in place. That said, if you go work for an insurer um, or like a pension fund um, or pension fund group, the, the working hours I've heard are a lot a lot more reasonable. Um, remember, there's, there's this famous quote by, by Nietzsche and he says, if you do not own more than two thirds of your time, you are a slave. And that is something that, especially I think coming from Joburg in Gauteng, there is a very, very strong work ethic there and people do, are prepared to sacrifice a lot of their life uh, to working hard. And as an actuary, 
you've got to be careful and think of the long term and say, hey, do I want to really like waste my 30s and 40s on my career and then I'm absolutely burnt out and don't have a family and all the, the other beautiful things that life has to offer. So yeah, that, it's a tricky question because some actuaries are working overtime, um, other actuaries are managing it well. It depends more on the, the company culture that you get employed uh, at rather than the profession um, as a whole. Um, question 19, what skills and experiences are most important for being an actuary? How can I start to develop these skills? Uh, what skills and experiences are most important? I would say programming is, is a good one, but at in grade 10, um, what's that, that's like 16, that age group, I would start going into probability, start learning about probability, start learning about um, the chances of getting different hands in poker, different gambling games. So gambling, you know, you're under 18, so don't, don't actually do the gambling, but study the mathematics around it. Um, so I would say start strengthening your, your probability at this age, and then when you get into university, because that's kind of one of the things that hits a lot of people out, um, you then should be good. Also, maths, maths is kind of like the, the fitness for an actuary. So just like how a soccer player needs to be fit in order to play a good game of soccer, so an actuary needs to be good at maths in order to just get on the field before they can start playing. So maths and probability are probably the best ones to, to start honing in, in now. Um, could you possibly explain the SERA qualification to me? The SERA qualification, it's essentially stands for Chartered Enterprise Risk uh, Actuary, and it is something that is synonymous with, say, FRM, which is the Financial Risk Managers. That's another profession out there. It's the actuarial take on it. And essentially, actuarial science, think of actuarial science as managing underwriting risks, which is mortality, morbidity, and like crashes and business risks and all of that kind of stuff, like general insurance. Whereas enterprise risk management also tells us to look at both market risk, which is, you know, stuff, investments and assets and liabilities, credit risk, which is banks, loans, borrowing, um, as well as operational risk, which is the fact that something could go wrong in an admin, admin um, system or employees might steal from you, all these kind of things. And enterprise has got this philosophy of being holistic and saying you have to look at all of these risks together because they interact uh, with each other rather than looking at risks in, in silos. Um, but it's a it's an add-on. So not all actuaries will get the SERA qualification. I did it just because I wanted a few more letters next to my name. I thought it would be cool. And I, I don't know, I'd, I'd enjoy studying. So I think whatever I'd studied, I would have enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy SERA. I've created quite a nice online course um, for the actual society on it with, gosh, just like 13 hours of content, 500 marks of exam walkthrough. That's what I was doing at the beginning of the year. It's a beautiful course, so I really, really love the subject. And it's something that you wouldn't necessarily do at university. This is something that you'll do afterwards when you're deciding what to, to specialize in. Um, if I were to study and qualify as an actor in South Africa and then further my studies for a SERA qualification, would I be able to work overseas and in America? So that's quite a quite a packed question. Um, if you've got the actuarial qualifications here in South Africa, you can then get into the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries in the UK. And once you're in there, you can then get into the American one. But you can't go directly from <laughs> South Africa to America for weird political reasons. But you can then get into, like I said, the UK is probably the home of actuarial science. So if you've got the South African one, you can get into that one, and then that basically opens all doors internationally. You can get uh, working visas, living visas, and it really allows you to explore the world and yeah, basically have, have quite a fun global adventure. So yes, that is one of the nice perks about studying actuarial science specifically in South Africa, is that it can help us get a visa to work overseas, whereas if you're not into the profession, um, you're going to struggle. So yeah, you can qualify for something known as a special talented visa or something like that. Anyway, that's a long, long discussion. And I think um, let's maybe wrap up with these last two questions. What country's board of actuaries would you recommend I qualify in? From what I understand, the UK exams are highly regarded internationally. 
UK and the South African exams, they're very, very similar. In fact, some of the, the subjects that you do, you're writing the UK exams. They're just administered by the Actual Society of South Africa. So they're very, very, very similar. Um, I would do the South African one because you're in South Africa. And the only little bit of a change is when it starts getting to the specialized subjects, the South African ones are more tailored to South African issues. And that's really beneficial when you're writing your exams because you want to be writing an exam where, like I remember in the one exam, we spoke about the the etol on the Gauteng Highway, and by living in Gauteng, being exposed to etol, you would be like, okay, cool. I know how to. I know a little bit about it when you're writing the exam. Compared to if you'd like, let's say, in England, and they're asking some Brexit question, and yes, you should be exposed to Brexit, but it's not something that you're reading up on a daily daily basis. So if you want to get into the fellowship. Um, it's a lot easier to do in your local country rather than trying to do through the UK. And then the last question is, do you have any further advice? The last bit of advice is you want to just think. I mean, especially coming from school, school you get by by putting in work, doing what you need to do, uh, regurgitating the work in the exam, and there's very, very small higher order skills. In fact, you can pass the whole of school without having any higher order skills as possible because it makes such a small part of the, the syllabus. Actuarial science is almost reversed. If you're not able to think um, and develop that critical judgment and those kind of things, you are gonna struggle in the exams because it's not like school where you just read the notes and then regurgitate them in the exam or, oh, this is the formula and then you just apply it and then, oh, get the marks. It's not as simple as that. They do throw curveballs, so you need to be able to think. And that's one of the big problems I, th I have with the, the school syllabus is because it's not teaching you to think. It's just kind of spoon feeding you. Like, like we've got these massive uh, curriculums where you just have to like learn so much, but you're just trying to memorize things rather than actually thinking things through and seeing how concepts connect and all that kind of stuff. So last bit of advice is if you're ever struggling with actuarial science, just stop, take a deep breath and and think and then yeah, hopefully hopefully you'll get through it. But yeah, I think that is that is the twenty three questions. And gosh, this has been a much longer video than that I was than I was intending. But hopefully that gave enough detail um, for your school project. So yeah. Hopefully you, hopefully you get an A on this project. Let me know how it goes. Anyway, thanks everyone else for watching and I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.